three, two, one. Let's imagine that you're um, invisible. And you're soaring through outer space. Moving at the speed of light. And as you fly, you dip up and down. Bending up and down. Like a, like a wave. And you are powerful. When you hit nearby planets, you stretch and squeeze them like Play-Doh. Mm-hmm. Sending ripples through space and even... Having an effect on time. Mm-hmm. And as rocks and stars and time itself apparently tremble in your wake, you became a gravitational wave. How do you say that in Spanish, by the way? Gravitational wave. Onda gravitacional. Onda. Onda gravitacional. Very good. Perfecto. <laughs> Gracias. All right. Well, now is the time when I try to make you sing the theme song with me. Sí. Como el, how is the song? Okay. Terrestrials, terrestrials, we are not the worst, we are the... And what do I say? Best trials. Terrestrials is a show where we uncover the strangeness waiting right here on Earth and sometimes break out into song. There's so much to discover when you listen close. Terrestrials, terrestrials. This time we get celestial. Meaning the stuff up there in the sky. Like stars, moons, suns, and you know. Outer space stuff. Terrestrials, terrestrials. Good voices, not required. I am your host, Lulu Miller, joined as always by my song bud. Hello, hello. Alan. Y hola a todos. And. Hola, Wanda, ¿cómo estás? Producer Anna, here to help me occasionally translate our very special guest, Dr. Wanda Diaz Merced. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Dr. Wanda is an astrophysicist, and she's joining us today from her high-security space observatory to tell us a story about a pack of gravitational waves that were headed right for planet Earth. Only very few people on Earth believed the waves were actually coming because we couldn't see them. So let's let's do this. I'm, I'm ready. Okay. So our story begins in the dark. The darkness of outer space 1.3 billion light years ago, when suddenly there's a crash. It was very powerful. Two giant black holes collided, and out of that collision came gravitational waves. Picture them like the ripples that come after you drop a pebble in a pond, only these waves can ripple space-time, meaning they will stretch and squeeze anything in their path, be it stars, planets, or even time itself. And some of these incredibly powerful and fast waves were headed right for planet Earth. Yes, sorry. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Now, no one on Earth knew the waves were coming for them because uh, there was no one on Earth yet. But even once humans appeared, they still had no idea that even a single wave was headed their way because... It doesn't fall into what we can perceive with... um, ¿Cómo se llama esto? Eh, With the thing I have on my face. eh, ¿Cómo? eh, I... The eyes. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. The human eyes. You forgive me. <laughs> and so we all walked around with our human eyes not seeing these waves headed our way until one dude, instead of using his eyes to look for what was out there, used his uh, imagination. This guy's name, by the way, was Albert Einstein. Maybe you've heard of him? Big hair, low bow tie. He conjured up this idea of spooky, invisible waves that could bend both space and time. What should I call them? Gravitational waves. But uh, very few people believed the waves were actually real. And then his time on Earth ran out. But in his wake, every so often, someone would read his work and believe. 
Yes, yes. Like this guy, Dr. Stavros Katsanevas. Because I I have seen the equations. A scientist from Greece who believed in Einstein's idea so deeply, he began standing up in front of meetings of fancy government officials. In front of the unbelievers. Saying he could prove the waves were out there if they would just give him millions of dollars to build a machine that was the size of a shopping mall and filled with... Lasers. And while Stavros joined the front lines of scientists saying that with the right machine, they could prove the waves were real. For 40 years, we were fighting. A little girl was born in Puerto Rico. I was born long, long after Albert Einstein in 1974. In a little town called Jorabo that was alive with things she couldn't see. During the nighttime, we would hear the coquis making the sound. Little tree frogs. And she began to wonder about the things that existed beyond the coquis. I do remember we went to the island of Culebra. The things above the coquis. There is no light pollution at all. And one night on the beach. I looked up and I saw so many stars. So many. It was um, it was like someone took um, a, a brush, dipped it in um, <laughs> in in white paint, and then just um, splashed the the brush on dark, huh. on on a very black wow. uh, background. Like a just big splatter all across the night sky. Like it was just more stars than you'd ever seen. See. And for some reason, I felt closer to them. But as Wanda was looking at those bright stars, dark spots were closing in. She didn't tell anyone at first, but she was going blind. And the less she could see the world around her, the more she felt lost. So, like many navigators before her, she turned to the stars for guidance. Though she couldn't see them anymore, she could still learn about them. So when she got to college, she took a bunch of physics classes. Though as she sat there in the lecture hall, giddy to listen to her professor explain how gravity and magnetism and electricity built our universe, she just heard, Today, we are discussing... Este, Gauss equation. She could hear the chalk writing on the blackboard, but had no way of knowing what the writing said. Like, like I'm, I'm thinking, what equation? Because Gauss had a number of equations. And then you hear the chalk circling. Shh. Was there ever a moment where you started to worry you would not be able to do science? See, that feeling of impossibility really kept me, kept me searching and searching and searching and trying and trying and trying and repeating class after class after class, regardless how much my lecturers would laugh at me. Mm. They'd laugh? Yes, they did. You should change your major, they'd say. You'll never be a blind astrophysicist. But I remember that uh, my mentor, Dr. Daisal Piqueda, that he said, let them say what they will. Whatever they're, they're saying, it tells more about them than about you. So Wanda kept searching and searching and searching, searching and searching and searching, trying and trying and trying. And then one day, she meets up with her really good friend. Emilio, who knew that I was losing my sight. And he was holding in his hand this really old device that he wanted to give to her called a radio. It's a radio receiver that receives uh, the waves that are emitted by an antenna, like the radio station. Only this radio wasn't picking up the hottest Puerto Rican tracks of the 90s coming from radio stations. It was able to hear things beyond the Earth. It was capable 
of detecting things like, for example, e emissions from the sun and also the galactic background. Wait, so like you're hearing that in real time? Yes. <gasps> I was hearing it. Wanda played us the sound of a bit of energy leaving Jupiter. And when I heard that, I thought there is a space for me in this science. So Wanda keeps listening to the night sky. She learns she can hear the rumbles of star earthquakes, which I guess should be called starquakes, and the whooshes of comets and the pulses of different planets. And when she first encounters the idea of gravitational waves, these invisible ripples that can rumble and rattle space even though we can't see them, she immediately believes in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of which, regardless of how many people believed in them, those gravitational waves from the long-ago collision of black holes were, by the year 2011, after Wanda has earned her PhD and landed a job at Harvard's Smithsonian Center, are getting very, like, very, 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 very close to planet Earth. What's going to happen when they hit? Find out after this short break. Terrestrials is back. A fleet of invisible gravitational waves are headed toward our planet where finally believers like Stavros... And Wanda and a bunch of folks at MIT, Caltech, and beyond have convinced governments to let them build this massive machine with two arms that are each over a mile long and filled with... Lasers? That should, using a complicated set of physics and mirrors, be able to detect if a gravitational wave actually passes through. That was my glory. <laughs> And since this machine detects the presence of gravitational waves by picking up interference in space-time, the machine is obviously called the inf inf in interferometer. interferometer. Yes. What's that new machine with those funky laser beams? It's the interferometer. Right on. And how will these astronomers detect data from the universe? The interferometer. That's right. Laser beam so strong, you shoot three kilometers long, oh yeah. Interferometer. That's 1.86 miles, my friend. These beams of light are going to expand our understanding of the universe. We hope, we think. It's a complicated machine, but nobody believes in it like Star Wars. And Maybe everyone will believe something no one ever could see when an invisible wave riding through space hits the Earth. So? Let's fire this machine up, see if this thing works. One day in 2015, scientists set the interferometer in motion and the lasers start searching and searching. And then, early in the morning on September 14th, 2015, suddenly... Did you hear it? Okay, one more time. Interference. And that little bloop is, is actually a gravitational wave hitting the Earth in real time? Exactly. Exactly. Oh. That's how we've heard the universe. You have a big smile on your face. Yeah, of course. Do you remember where you were that day? Sí, claro. Of course I remember. Juan is working in the Harvard lab at the time. We, we heard the news. Everyone is in their office. Everyone is excited. But also everyone is, everyone <laughs> is working. So like you're whispering like, a gravitational <laughs> wave has been detected. <laughs> oh, we've been waiting. We've been waiting for decades for this to happen. <laughs> oh my God, finally. <laughs> it, uh, you, you get excited. And as for those waves... 
They didn't hurt anyone or anything, but they did knock things around a little bit. They jiggled buildings. They shook the lasers and mirrors of the interferometer, which is how we knew they hit. They changed the distance between cities. For just a moment, they messed with time. Which Which I still don't really understand. understand. But But I gotta gotta keep keep moving on with the story. Even in our bodies. We didn't know this, right? But our bodies may have vibrated. Like a little Um, ripple, like as it passed through, we all kind of jiggled a tiny bit. Like a wiggly, like a wiggly. (laughs) But we didn't didn't know this, right? Um, Wow. We couldn't feel it. We couldn't see the waves. But the reason the scientists knew they had hit was again because of sound. There is much more than what the eye alone can perceive. Space, Wanda says, is noisy with information that we can use our sense of hearing to understand. But we, we are trained not to use it. Uh, so what, what I want to bring is that we, we kind of detach ourselves from using all my senses in the process of learning. She worries in particular about astronomers, astrophysicists. Their training is strictly visual. Hmm. They are fine men and women, right? Mm-hmm. Um, great researchers. But what is visible is just a itty bitty tiny region, <laughs> tiny region of the electromagnetic, <laughs> so limited. Huh. We have passed all these years in light and shadow. We did not use sound as a a discovery instrument. We did not use all the senses. When Stavros heard about Wanda's work, he reached out to her. And now they work together at the Interferometer near Pisa, Italy, where she's training him and other scientists how to recognize more and more sounds coming from space. Each one of them is a cosmic piano. Turns out with the right tools, you can hear not just the echoes from long ago collisions, but the cries of baby stars being born and the rattle of old stars dying and the whooshes of comets and all kinds of things you could never see through a telescope like interstellar turbulence and wind. Each one of them has its own frequencies. And the symphony of all those different frequencies raining down from space can give humanoid scientists new clues about the evolution of the universe and even the potential for life on far away planets. We did experiments simulating astronomy information. When professional astronomers used audio, Mm -hmm. their sensitivity to events that were hidden in the data increased. Wait, meaning they could understand more about what was happening in space when they used their ears? Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. That's their fantastic thing. Wild. Now, as for the end of the story of what happened to those gravitational waves from those two black holes that collided long ago... Well, after they literally rocked our world, (laughs) get it? Because they, like, rocked the planet when they hit. Uh, Well, they just kept rippling out into the universe, passing by stars and moons. What I imagine is the amount of unimaginable, unimaginable things those ripples may find on their way Hmm. as they travel into into infinity, right? The wonderful things that they will like find Like what? In like planets and comets and beyond suns? Beyond, uni- uh, un- unimaginable. I will shake anything that's in my way 
And as I rattle space and time I leave it all behind Everything we've ever known Unimaginable Wander in the dark night sky Towards infinity I fly Beyond the planets and the stars The asteroids and meteors Beyond the galaxies we've named And all the ones we've yet to tame I go, I go and go and go mystery because we do not know about it and the fact that we do not know about it it doesn't mean they do not exist and the fact that we do not know about it it doesn't mean they do not exist it doesn't mean they do not exist and I don't care if I'm alone in this and nobody believes I will swim this sky forever I will always feel the breeze When everything that is familiar Fades to black and turns to cold I will listen on in wonder Unimaginable Unimaginable Songbud Bring in the ballad this week. Putting his heart on the line. Where's your heart? Is it on the line? Or is it in a cage? Terrestrials was created by me, Lulu Miller, with WNYC Studios. It is produced by the time and mind-bendingly amazing Anna Gonzalez and Alan Gafinski, along with me. With help from Susie Lechtenberg, Sarah Sambach, Natalia Ramirez, Miriam Bernard, Natalie Mead, Joe Plord, and Sarita Bott. With sound design this episode by Phoebe Wang. Our advisors are Theanne Griffith, Aaliyah Elijah, Tara Welty, Liza Steinberg, Demby, Dominique Shabazz, and Alice Wong. Terrestrials is supported in part by Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Special thanks this episode to Bryn Bliska for original cosmic keyboard Diddly-dly-dly. and to J.D. Voyek, Sam Schultz, Vincenzo Napolitano, Emilio, and Jeremy Bloom. Now, you should stop listening to this wonky collection of sound waves because there is nothing else cool about that. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Excuse me, I have a question. Me too. Me three. Me four. The Badgers. Listeners with badgering questions for the expert. Are you ready? Speak. Hi, my name is Barrett, and I'm eight years old. I was wondering, would the gravitational pull of a black hole stretch you as thin as a piece of spaghetti if you got sucked into it? (laughs) I see. If I'm approaching the the black hole head first, my head will be pulled towards the black hole. Wow. As my feet are are being pulled away from me, I'm I'm becoming a piece of spaghetti. Yes, yes, yes. Pasta luego. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rex. I'm eight years old. My question is, once a star dies, can it come back to life? Ay, que pregunta. What a beautiful question. As far as, far as we know, once that object dies, elements that are vital for the generation of life as we know it here on Earth are spread it all over the universe. Hmm. So the star doesn't come back to life, but we do? Yes. The star corpses is the seeds of life. My name is Emily Silverman, and I'm 34 years old. My question is, could we ever use gravitational waves to propel ourselves through space at faster than the speed of light? I do not believe in impossibles, right? But very, way unlikely, way unlikely. Hello, my name is Bruce Nichols. I'm 10 
And my question is, is there an end to the universe? I don't know. I don't think so, no. All right, I'll leave it there. Infinite possibility ahead and behind, and I definitely won't tell you the thing that Wanda told me that's still bothering me at night, which is that apparently we are all on our way to turning into black holes. I'm nice, so I won't curse you with that knowledge. Don't worry, it's not going to happen for like millions of years. If you would like to badger an expert or suggest a topic for the show, head on over to our website, terrestrialspodcast.org. There, we also have special drawing prompts that were made for every episode by the incredible Wendy Mack of the Draw Together podcast. For this one, she has you draw different sounds, and it's just this neat podcast that you can listen to. So she's like encouraging you and coaching you in your ear while you draw. So much fun. You can find that again, along with other activities and videos on our website, terrestrialspodcast.org. Org. If you are liking the show, please rate and review us. It helps our chance of continuing on. Thank you so much for listening. Catch you in a couple spins of this star-dusted old planet of ours. <laughs>